Hello, everybody. It's good to be with you today. I have prepared another presentation here, and what I want to do in this presentation is I want to revisit some of these historical cases that I've covered before, but this time I've got new illustrations, new drawings, new full-color renderings that I thought justified kind of a revisit on some of these cases. So let's go ahead and jump right in here. And we'll move to the first case. Um, this is a C-119 flying boxcar, Sierra Madre Valley, Mexico, prior to 1951. Now, I believe it was around 1948 where this actually took place. And you can see here in this picture, this is an actual C-119 flying boxcar. Source for this was UFO crash retrievals, page 32. And uh, if you look at the bottom here, we're talking about a nine foot diameter disc shaped craft and at least two ET bodies were recovered. So we've got this highway engineer, he's this construction engineer, and he was asked to assist in a crash retrieval. Now, question is, how do we know what the diameter of the saucer was in this particular retrieval? And I'm gonna take you to the next slide here and explain how we calculated this. So if you look at the inside cargo bay of a C-119, research indicates that the interior thickness of the cargo bay is nine feet, 10 inches wide. That means the craft can't be any more than nine feet in diameter. That allows five inches of clearance on either side. So that's how we gauged what the diameter of the craft was. And we'll move forward here. And now you can see coming into view here, Rudy Gardet is drawing of the craft being loaded into aft cargo bay doors. You can see the clamshell doors have been opened and they're loading this craft in. So this construction engineer was asked to assist in this crash retrieval. And at this point, we'll go ahead and move on to the next full color rendering here. And now you see this is uh, by Joseph Wraith. The, the retrieval operation is now in full swing. Uh, we've got some bodies kind of in the foreground here. The clamshell doors have been opened up, and now you can see them on this ramp moving the craft into the aft bay of the C-119. I'm going to zoom in here so that you can kind of get a better look at what we're dealing with here. And now you can see this retrieval operation. I, I just wonder what it would be like to actually be here. Um, can, can all these crash retrievals be true? Are these witnesses lying to us, or are they telling us the truth? Um, there just seems to be way too many people coming forward, uh, and in, in historical times too. They, they can't all be lying to us. They just can't all be lying to us. So let's move to the next one here, and I'm going to give you a little bit better view of what these bodies look like. Now, this is according to a VIP. The source here was a VIP, and he's mentioned in the chapter in the book within the Leonard Stringfield uh, dictation notes and also within his uh, status reports that have been published into one volume. And this VIP keeps being mentioned in this particular volume, and we're going to identify who this person is, but let me just hit you with what was said here. Ah, senor, he said, they were handsome, those little men with fine features and beautifully formed hands, but there must have been an explosion in their craft for they were burnt black. And when I touched the face of one of them, the skin came off under my fingers as though it had been cooked. So is this another one of these instances where one of these craft were shot down by the military industrial complex? That might be the case here. Uh, so this is our main man here, General George C. Marshall. He's mentioned in the Stringfield book as one of the persons that was very much familiar with crash retrievals uh, during World War II, after World War II, Army Chief of Staff during World War II. This is the man to do some research on and do some digging. So that's exactly what I did. And if you move forward here, his papers are part of the George C. Marshall Foundation. And so I dug up and found out where this was. And if you look at the, it's kind of a finding aid here. And what we're interested in looking at is this part here that says uh, Secretary of Defense, 1950 to 1952. And then it also says uh, over here, 1945 to 1947, Secretary of State. That's that's what we want to look for. Those are the correct dates 
for the records to pull. So I may end up going here and pulling some records. Maybe there's something there, but it's important that we run these to ground and leave no stone unturned. So that is the C-119 flying boxcar case. All right, next one. Naval Air Station, Sunnyvale, California, Hangar 1, which still exists today. You can go to this hangar. It's massive. It's so massive that it has its own weather. It's just unbelievable. Uh, Doorward Buddy Hawk was a radar observer. He crashed in an airplane crash near San Diego many, many, many years ago, no longer with us, but he's the primary source of this, this particular retrieval operation case. And the source is UFO crash retrievals, case B5, page 57. So I'm gonna set this up here. He walks through a double door. Initially, there wasn't a guard in the hangar. And when he got inside the hangar, what did he see? He sees a large, approximately 100-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It had a series of windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft. And then he was challenged by a guard and told to get out of there immediately. So he did see this craft there. And now I'm just going to go back up one here. This is what this witness said. And I've got it at the bottom here. Quote, it was certainly no aircraft of ours. So this is another one of these cases where military sources are coming to us. They're telling us their testimony that they're seeing these dish-shaped craft, the ET bodies, the debris, the craft, the pathologists, uh, the reports from different hospitals. They're all telling us this motif, this story that we're piecing together here. All right, next one, classified materials library at an unknown U.S. Air Force base. This was a former military officer. The Source is UFO crash retrievals, page 212 to 213. So this gentleman had the right clearances to be in the right place at the right time. He's in this materials library. See, he opens up one of these file drawers and he pulls out a file. And uh, Rudy's done a very good job giving you an idea what this thing actually looked like. In the file was a report on a crash retrieval in Farmington, New Mexico, somewhere prior to 1950. And there was a black and white glossy photograph there about a 36 foot diameter dish shaped craft. It had a dome on top. It had a series of portholes wrapped around the outer portion of the uh, upper dome. And then it said in the report that they were trying to use diamond tip drill bits to get into this thing. This, this is the fourth time I've heard this. So this is absolutely what's going on. The military industrial complex in conjunction with the intelligence agency are desperately, repeat, desperately trying to breach the hull of the craft of these things to reverse engineer not only their propulsion systems, but their advanced energy systems as well. And I want to go over some of the key points here. Number one. Military officer had the correct security clearance, which gave him access to a classified materials library. Number two, report seen by witness made reference to crashes, plural, and that bodies were recovered. Number three, in addition, diamond tip drill bits and acetylene torches were used to gain access to the interior. Now, reference 1946 craft seen at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which we already covered and then 40-foot diameter craft guarded by a U.S. Marine during December of 1963, which we already covered as well. Now, point number four, eventually, technicians were able to gain access to the interior of the craft by way of a small entry hatch. The report said, referring to the door, that it was, quote, almost as if the material of the craft liquefied and then solidified again. So this is what we're hearing, too. You can't even fit a razor blade between the seams of these door hatches. They, they appear to be so completely integrated into the outer exterior skin of the craft as though it's liquid metal. That's what we're dealing with here. Okay, now, why is Farmington important in all of this? Why is Farmington important? Well, that's very important because of something called the Farmington Armada. Now, this is Albuquerque Journal, March 18th, 1950. Hundreds at Farmington report large force of flying saucers. So this would have been the 17th of March, 1950. And there were literally 500 dish-shaped craft that were seen by multiple witnesses over Farmington, uh, New Mexico. And some of these uh, were making these 
very erratic flight paths. They were making right-hand turns. They were backing up. The quote-unquote leader of the group was a red dish-shaped craft, so very interesting. And uh, that's interesting because around the same time frame, early 1950s, there was a standing order that went out from the U.S. Air Force to all of our pilots to, quote unquote, shoot these things down. And so you can see these uh, newspaper clippings here. The Cincinnati Inquirer, July 29th, 1952. Shoot saucers down, jets pilots so ordered in 24-hour air alert. I'm going to go to a couple others here. Jets keep keeping 24-hour alert for saucers. Pilots ordered to shoot down objects if they don't land. On the saucer trail, pilots told to shoot them down. Jets on 24-hour alert to shoot down saucers. And this goes on and on and on. This went, you know, like throughout 1952, Frank, there was a desperate order to shoot these things down so that the military industrial complex could exploit the technology and reverse engineer their propulsion and whatever they felt they could use for a weapon system. So you can see the mentality. Now, this is the craft that was generally being used for the intercepts, an F-94 Starfire. And if you go to the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, off to the left here, you can see one of these F-94 that's parked out up there on the desert. And in this picture on the left, it's got these rocket flaps in the nose in the closed position. If you go to the right, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, you can see the flaps have been retracted where they would shoot the rockets off and hopefully try to down one of these craft. Um, so you can see the, the military has a hostile posture against these craft. It's not the ET craft, but it's actually the United States military that has the hostile posture. So that's this is the one at the Air Force Museum and we'll move forward here now. Here's Rudy's drawing that gives you a very good indication of what one of these intercepts may have looked like in the early 1950s time frame. And we'll go to the next one. Now, why is all of this important? Why is all of this important? Now, this is a letter that was written by Mildred Bissell to Leonard Stringfield. The date is October 2nd, 1979. I thought this was very interesting. Here's what she said. I heard you speak at the MUFON Symposium in Dayton last year, and I am interested in your research on retrievals of the third kind. I gave a talk at a local library last week, and in the discussion period following, a fellow told me that when he was a gunner in the Air Force, he had emptied his guns on a UFO and had taken pictures with his gun camera that clearly showed the shells exploding against the side of the craft. He said the camera was taken off the wing of his plane when it landed, and the pictures developed. At 2 a.m., a couple of military policemen came and got him out of bed and took him to the base auditorium. They ran the 17 seconds of movie of the UFO over and over and questioned him and two other crew members until 10 a.m. He was warned never to tell anyone what had happened. He said he had a wife and family and a good job and a lot to lose. He seemed afraid of the CIA and wouldn't even give me his name. So you can see here that this gentleman was a pilot. He unloaded an entire magazine of shells on this craft. It ricocheted off the side of the craft. They got this all on gun camera footage. So if this happened once, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's happened multiple times and they have uh, repositories all around the country where they store gun camera footage, uh, ET bodies, ET craft, uh, they would have 8x10 glossy black and whites, 8x10 uh, color photographs, and these would be at uh, Andrews Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Homestead Air Force Base, McDill Air Force Base. Obviously, the United States military, they operate on a no single point failure policy. They're not going to put all of their assets in one location because if it was hit by a missile or there was a some type of a fire, they'd lose all of their crown jewels. So they're going to spread these assets around the country. Absolutely, that's what they've done here. Okay, next one, Fort Polk, Louisiana. This is summer 1953. Private in the Army. This is case A1, page 80, from Leonard Springfield's book that I've talked about before. I want to take you into this scene now, and uh, this is what it looked like. This particular individual saw the entire operation from the beginning to the end. This was an egg-shaped craft about 30 feet across. 
uh, when it landed, the soil was still uh, very hot. It was kind of a ray, a red clay soil where this thing came down, 30 feet in diameter, 30 feet across. It had what looked like a fin wrapped around the outer portion of the craft that was still rotating. There was an entryway hatch that opened up, and uh, there were three beings that walked out. Now, they walked out with the assistance of military personnel there, and they had these one-piece tight-fitting flight suits on. It looked like they had helmets on and they had mittens on. And also it appeared that they had no knee joints. So it was very stair-stepped, a very jittery, uh, stiff type of movement. And one of them was carried out on a litter. And it, and it appeared that the three that came out of the craft were trying to communicate to the one that was on the litter. They were bringing that toward the ambulance truck that you can see here. All right, now let's move to the color illustration. Very well done by uh, Rudy Gardea here. Want to give him credit. Here is the full color illustration by Joseph Wraith. And now we're looking at the scene here. <clears throat> this is approximately 45 degree look down angle on the scene. You can see the craft. You can see this ridge that went around it. Uh, now we've got the door opened up. The beings are walking out with the assistance of the military police. We've got the one on the litter on its way to the ambulance truck. And let's move ahead and we'll go to another illustration here. Now we've, we've enlarged the scene. We're doing a blow up here. You can see the one piece tight fitting flight suit. We've got the helmets on. The report said that they were wearing what looked like mittens, which is very unusual. I haven't heard that too much, but that's what's being reported by these witnesses here. And we'll move on to the next slide here. And now we've got this uh, ET being put into the F portion of this ambulance truck in this particular crash retrieval. So the body count just keeps on going up as we go through the decades here. It's just amazing what's been going on uh, under the public's noses and the world. Okay, so here's the final blow up on this particular case. Uh, and we do know what happened here. I'm gonna move to the next slide here. So what happened to the survivors? According to the source, the survivors had been sent to a hospital and put into isolation but all soon died. He also learned that the cadavers were sent to a medical center near Washington, D.C. Okay, so what type of medical center in Washington, D.C. would they be talking about? The only one that makes sense where kind of all roads lead to this location, the only one that makes sense is this one right here, Walter Reed Army Medical Center. It closed down in 2011, but this is more than likely where at least these bodies were brought. Uh, we could probably safely assume that other bodies were brought here too. So we've got the pathologist reports that have been moved from this location to an unknown facility. There would be ET craft, there would be um, the pathologist reports, we would have tissue samples, we would have autopsy reports, we would have uh, eight by 10 black and white glossy photographs. So somewhere this information is being kept from the public and we're hearing all this talk about congressional hearings, they need to track down these records and bring them out into the public domain for open public hearings, and then we can move this ball forward. So just wanted to give everyone a really quick update here. Thank you for your attention, and we're going to continue with the crash retrievals. I'm not going to give up the fight. We are not going to let these guys get away with it, and I want to thank you again for your attention.